If we could, we will get started. Uh, you can still enjoy the awesome treats while uh, listening. Right? Uh, so if you see Paisley or Matthias for some happy birthday, as the occasion today is their birthday, fifth and seventh, seven year old, uh, respectively, and put together for this. Uh, treat. All right, last week, uh, we started out and we covered this new study we're starting. Uh, I hope to take about two months to cover all of it. Um, Again, that we're, that we're going to do this study because the Christian lives in the fallen world and we are open to its wickedness. Uh, we have not always handled things well. Uh, I will be the first to tell you that one of the most common problems you find in the church as far as stewardship is that pastors often won't teach it uh, because it often seems self-serving. Okay? Uh, pastors need to get over themselves and just teach the word of God. Okay? Um, so there will be time to tackle into questions. I apologize. The box has gotten back. It will be there next week. And then some general topics and so forth. And so one of those general topics to start out with uh, was who is God? <laughs> we covered especially God as our creator. And that makes us his creatures. And the relationship between creator and creature is that uh, we don't really get to dictate to him. Uh, he teaches us. He directs us and so forth. Okay. Now we did get into a little bit of who are you then and what were you created for? And so I started to introduce the idea of godliness, that is being like unto God. Okay, so as God is, that's how we want to try to be. God is good, we would try to be good. Good. God is merciful, we, we be merciful. God is loving, we try to be loving, and so forth. So we want to uh, imitate God him and so that is kind of this picture of godliness and of course redemption and sanctification uh, as god has redeemed us bought us back and so forth this adds to this uh relation we have to our god um but it also teaches us more about what our god is willing to do for us and what he's willing to uh to to undergo for our sake and sanctification being of course that life that God gives us in this life, or by the Holy Spirit, we increase in both faith in Jesus, but also in love for our neighbor, a life of good works, and so forth. And so our goal then being to reflect more and more of God's own being and goodness uh, in our lives. Okay? That God is generous. God is one who sacrifices. God is one who is uh, overly kind. And so we would seek to be the same. Okay? And so as we look about how we live our lives, we're going to want to reflect upon how God has revealed himself to be. Okay? Um, and so there you have the cre creatures from Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, so here are creatures and their creator. So I asked you guys to look at the first article of the Creed last week, as well as the Ten Commandments. Uh, the commandments are going to become key as we get into the actual topic of good works. But you have this first article of the Creed. Okay. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who has made me and all creatures, given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason, and all my senses, still takes care of them. Clothing, shoes, food, drink, house, home, wife, children, land, animals, all that I have. He richly and daily provides me. So here I would draw attention as Pastor Baby does to the adverbs. Now, why words in the Catechism? 
He richly and daily provides me, because that teaches you about who he is. He richly and daily does this stuff. He's faithful, and he does this over and over and over again, and he does it over abundantly. But all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, which assumes there are dangers out there for us. We know them as the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. Guards protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or goodness in me. That's saying basically, we don't, we are not the cause of God being good to us. God is good to us because God is God and God is good. It is not something he does in response to our goodness. Only out of his fatherly divine goodness and mercy. And, and then it has a little bit for us. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. And finally, we get something to do. For all that stuff God does. Okay? That's, that's how it usually works. Okay? For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. All of this is only in response to first knowing what God has done. Okay? Now, the whole study, I'm going to be referencing stewardship throughout. And here, especially, I want to draw your attention to as creatures, how stewardship was a part of even the original creation. Before the fall into sin, God had said things about stewarding what God gives. That is how you handle the things that God gives you. And so here in Genesis 1, he, he creates male and man, it's a man and woman, gives them what? Dominion over the earth. They are to manage, they are to have lordship over the creation. There's stewardship involved in dominion. Because if you are a bad uh, steward over a dominion, what's going to happen to your dominion? It'll fall apart. Be gone. See the history of rulers. Right? On top of that, there's a general command for dominion over all the earth, but then there's a very localized command from God to Adam in Genesis 2, where he tells him to tend and keep the garden. Okay? One of the things I'm going to be emphasizing over and over again throughout these couple months is this, this stewardship you have been given, this life you are to live as a Christian is immensely localized. That, that there is a general love your neighbor, but there is a very specific, hey, guess what? God has actual people around you in your life. Okay? You actually have things that God has actually given you. God has actually put you in places, in relationships to others, in a place, uh, in a time. And, and so there is actual, like, specific, concrete things that you can do. And so that's Genesis 2. Genesis 1, have dominion over all creation, general command. Genesis 2, he's telling Adam, hey, here's this garden. You need to tend it and keep it. Okay. So please take note that in the perfect creation, there was still work. Okay. Um, there was still work to be done. Now, it isn't until Genesis 3 that we hear about sweat and toil. That's part of the fall. But there was always work. Okay. And it's good for us to have work. Okay. Also, then, you have the implied care for family as father and mother. So when he says, be fruitful and multiply, I will give him a helper fit for him. And then as Genesis moves on, it says, these are the generations of. And then, of course, uh, finally, Adam's praise of the woman and praise of God because of the gift of the woman, that for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will fast to his wife and two will become one flesh. So implied here is all the care God has for the family. That is the household. Okay? And so we're going to talk a lot about how this kind of being a Christian starts first and foremost in your home. And that includes if you have wife, children, or if it's just you. Okay? Uh, that your home is still your home. Your household is your household, even if it's just a household of one. Okay? But this is all part of being a creature, but it's also part of being redeemed and so forth. But I just want to show you that all of this is even in the perfect creation. Before the fall into sin. The fall into sin is just going to monkey this all up. It's going to make our priorities odd. And it's going to make us kind of want to not have the right priorities. Okay? That we will have lost this godliness. And now we're kind of corrupted. And we struggle and strive. And without God's help, we won't get it back. 
Okay. When you get to the second article of the creed, you get to the Redeemer. This is the work of Christ in, in, in redeeming you, purchasing you with his own body, uh, with his blood. And that second article of the creed ends with that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom. Okay. In everlasting innocence, righteousness, and blessings. Okay. That, that redeemed means to be bought. Okay. Uh, as, as you heard it in today's uh, gospel lesson, as well as, as the sermon, you know, you're going to be a master or someone else or something else is going to be your master. None of you are free agents. None of you have independence. You are going to be under someone. And, and that someone, according to Christ, should be Christ because he has shown himself to be utterly benevolent towards you, uh, giving freely of himself everything in order that you would be his own. And that was without you doing anything to deserve that. In fact, you've done everything to not deserve that. But Christ does it anyway. Because again, he is of the Father, and that means the same goodness that is the Father's goodness that created you and, and cares for you without any merit or worthiness in you is streaming through the Son. And so the Son gives himself for you. It was the Father's will. The Son knew this. The Son obeyed his Father's will and came down from heaven. And, and saved us, right? We've been redeemed, we've been bought back. Now, the Holy Spirit then comes in in the third article of the Creed with keeping us and keeping the church. That word keeping is also a good stewardship word. That we find out that God himself manages things. That the Holy Spirit is managing his church. That he is keeping her. And that he keeps us as Christians. And that our life of sanctification is under his stewardship, his management of us. Okay. And so throughout this, you're going to see shifts into sanctification, sanctification that is being made holy, where our earthly lives as the redeemed happen to be lived out. That you were indeed bought with a price. And that your earthly life has been utterly, completely changed and affected by what Christ has done for you. Okay? You are not ungodly anymore. You have not completely lost the image of God. God has now begun to restore that in you. Christ has brought you back. You are not under Satan anymore. Okay? So if you look at 1 Corinthians 6 and 7 on this, Oh, we'll go through the whole chapters. Um, but, so just looking at the headings. Lawsuits against believers. Okay? And then, of course, Paul gives great advice about, hey, Christians, don't do that. But that's immensely of this life. Right? Lawsuits, going to court. Okay? God's word has all kinds of things to say about our daily lives. Here, of course, he gets into fleeing sexual immorality. Well, that's completely earthly. As in heaven, they're not given in marriage. Right? But that this is for procreation. This is meant to be something of this earthly life. But yet, it is something that sin has so perverted that now, in the, in the reordering of things, God says it again, how our lives should be ordered around this gift of sex. Okay? And so he spends time talking about it. This is ordinary daily life that he's talking about. And he's going back uh, all the way to what God has done in Christ, what he did for creation. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but the Lord and for the Lord for the body. So he's going back to created language. He goes back to redemption language. All of it, your relationship to God affects your day-to-day -day life. Okay. Then he, of course, gets into marriage in chapter 7. Okay, Remember, the, the first Corinthians letter is a letter to a really messed up church. Okay, If you ever think church is like the church is bad and there's messed up people in the church, read 1 Corinthians. You'll be okay. okay? There's people doing things in 1 Corinthians that, that you know, we, we, we haven't heard of. But they happened then. Okay, so, so Corinth is a kind of messed up church. 
but yet God reaches out to them through Paul's letter and so forth. But he does so in, in dealing with common, ordinary things, things of lawsuits, of your rights, of your privileges, things of how you conduct yourselves with your bodies, things of marriage, good institutions by God, how it should be kept, how it should be uh, handled in a sinful world. Right? How husbands and wives ought to interact with each other. Right? Um, yeah, and, and just all these other things. He, he finalized, live as you are called. So then here he actually gets into the idea that, you know, in the condition you were in when you were called, stay there. So especially here, he deals with, you know, if you were a slave, continue being a slave. He's literally talking about slaves in, in Rome. Some of the main masses of converts to the Christian church were slaves. Okay? Because they heard the message of Christ setting the captives free. Right? That, that he, has, he has won them from that. So, so the message of the gospel really resonated with slaves. But then the temptation was, well, I'm a Christian now. I'm free from all this. I don't have to be a slave anymore. Paul says, no, you still are. It's okay. You belong to the kingdom of God. Whatever earthly situation you're in, do right by it. Do your good, do your best in it. Now, he also says, if you're able to get free, you can free. But he's not talking about like running away or anything like that. We have that from the, from the book of Philemon, where he, he's returning a runaway. Okay. But he, but he's, you know, this, these earthly situations, he says, the fact that God has created you, God has redeemed you, God has sanctified you, has everything to do with your earthly situation. So, so he's doing that. He's, he's teaching them, you know what? Stay in the situation of life you're in. You know? Um, for he who is called the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Okay? So that, that you were bought with a price. Not become bond servants of men, so brothers, in whatever condition was called, there let him remain with God. Live your life, but now is one who's been bought. Then, of course, he deals with the unmarried and the widowed. Okay. He talks about directions for them based upon them being created, redeemed, being sanctified. That, that you have this throughout various epistles, this directions towards daily life and how you ought to conduct it as a Christian. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want you free from anxieties. That ties into to today, right? That's where he exhorts singleness. Okay. All right, and then he gets into how they interact with the world in their day-to-day -day life. I know I didn't mention this, but food, uh, food offered to idols. They live in a land of idols. And so idol worship happened, and, and the, the meat that was used to sacrifice to the god of blah, 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 uh, was often then put out on the market. And it was usually cheaper. And, and Paul says, well, you, you can buy that and eat that. That's fine, as long as you're not offending someone by it. Okay? But it had to do even then with you know eating. Not that it gave dietary laws like Moses' law did, but it, you're free from this. You, you're free from food offered to idols. You, idols are nothing. You know that. Okay, so live your lives. Okay, that's okay. Unless your brother is offended by it. Okay. Um, so how much of earthly life is affected by what Christ has done? Well, you can look to the scriptures and find that every aspect of our life. Okay. Uh, from our homes to our workplaces, from it, uh, to our life in a country, uh, to our life in the church, obviously. All of it's tied together. Now, then, of course, the question, what does baptism do? As we're going through redemption and sanctification here. What did God do to you when he baptized you? Okay. Um, and then we'll go to Titus 3, I think. Then we'll read you that. He basically brought you into Christianity, didn't he? Yeah, well, he, he bought you into Christianity. He bought you into the kingdom of God. Uh, he made you his child. There's all kinds of analogies for baptism from the Holy Scriptures. Here's one, however. Uh, remember, he's going to get to baptism down here in verse 5 and 6 and so forth. But look at this section, how it starts out. 
Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, show perfect courtesy towards all people. How much of earthly life is covered in that? Yeah. Right? Yeah, be a Christian isn't just about Sunday morning. Sunday morning's included in it. But it's it's really about the rest of our lives. And so God helps to order our lives and put us in a way of godliness, being uh, imitating God in the position he puts us in. So here it is. Uh, to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Why? Because they're so good? No. God is the way he is to us because it's without any mark or worthiness in us. Why are we the way we are towards government? Because God gave us government. Okay. Obedient, ready for every good work. The early church really excelled in that. They became known for the good work because, of course, the good work was so foreign to the pagans. They were, they were shocked when an when a, uh, outbreak of whatever happened in a town, the pagans would flee. The rich people would go to their country cottages. Uh, in Rome, there was a season of months where uh, the, the flies and mosquitoes and stuff would enter town and the disease would pick up and everything else. And all the rich people had these villas they leave and they go to, right? Who would come into town during those months? The Christians would make an extra effort to care for those who were sick and poor. Right? I guess I have a hard time with that. These dismissive rulers and authorities. I'm not exactly the dismissive type. Yeah. But, uh, Going back into thinking of, let's say, a child I see that was molested or whatever, and I went after the situation. So, was I wrong with God going against authority? They were doing things out of it. And I finally got to the town of the people. Why did you get to have it? The authorities got involved? Yes, I mean, well, I don't know the public situation where they got into <laughs> do we do we have a system of governance where we can address concerns and make appeals? But you obviously at one point we had enough of appeal that Caesar reacted. That's the system we have, which is not a bad system. So the big reason, however, why would you be submissive to rulers? So why would you seek to be a good husband? Why would you seek to be a good wife? Why would you do anything? Why would we take care of people? Why would you stay as a slave? Why would you? The point of this study is to point out why you do that? Because God's behind all of it. God's behind government. Yes, sinners are in government. So there's going to be all kinds of horrible lapses of judgment in government. The history of the world just records, you know, one failure of government after another. So, well, is what? No, some sinners did some things there. But God corrected the measure through government. Okay? That's what government's given to do, is to punish the wicked, okay? And so that's where we absolutely should support government. Um, elsewhere in Scripture, says to pray for those who are in authority over you. So we do that. But we also honor government, not because of how government performs, but because of who's behind government. Who gave us government? God did. This starts in creation. Adam's the head of the household. He's the first king, governor, whatever, president. I don't care what word you want to use it. At one point, all the three estates, we're going to get the estates in a couple of weeks, you know, the home, the church, and the government were all located in Adam's household. And so Adam was husband and father. Adam was king and ruler, and he was pastor. At one point in the world's history, that was everything there, right? But it was God always behind that. He set up those offices for the goodness of creation. Now, in the fall, now government has that responsibility of now punishing wrongdoing and being a curb against it. But that's a good thing that God has created and given. And so we give honor to it, again, because it's God who gave it. It's the same way that you can still give thanks to God when you yourself are going through a horrendous time in your life. Because behind all of our sickness and suffering and trials and stuff, there is still a loving God who has this happening, and I'm going to benefit from it somehow. Because that's what my faith says. That's what the scriptures teach. 
And so even bad government, God is still behind it. Now, in this case, our government in this country, if I'm going to speak frankly about it, is yes, God is judging our country. Okay. But if you read the, the scriptures, that's good for us. Okay. Is it fun? Is it painful? Well, it's not fun. And it, yeah, it's painful. You don't like seeing things fall apart that you kind of looked at like, oh, this is good. And it's falling apart. Okay. That's all related to, to, to the judgment of God happening. And yesterday I spoke to the to the, the elder of yoga group and, and we went through some church history stuff. And I just pointed out again, you know, we're still talking about these Christians, but what happened to the Romans? They're gone. Right? And so every time government tries to resist God, it, it disappears. God does that with it. Okay. Well, our, our government's been kind of thumbing its nose at God for quite some time. So God's finally going to start saying, enough. And he does it oftentimes through bad rulers or other powers. Okay. But through it all, you're still Christians. You know? There were Christians in Rome in 476 when Rome fell. There were Christians in Rome in 477. Okay. They were Christians, whether it was the Romans or whether it was somebody else. Okay. So, okay. And they prayed for the Romans in 476, and they prayed for whoever else it was in 477. And they're submissive. But notice, this is, this is everything of life, right? Show perfect courtesy towards all people. Guess what? We are we have no license to be jerks. We don't, okay? For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasure, passing our days of malice and envy, hated by others, hating one another. Boy, there's a description of the world, right? The unbelieving world. Foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. There's your description. World. We ourselves were once this. Okay? So Paul, when he's exhorting this Christian life, he also starts with a humble place. Because you were once there. Okay? You know what it is to be in a world like that. You know what it is to participate in a world like that. But what? When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Okay? God didn't leave it to that. God didn't leave you in that. Right? He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So again, without any merit or willingness in us. But according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, your baptism language, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. God entered the picture, saved us, redeemed us, that we can sit here and say, we ourselves were once that way. Not anymore. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Of course, he's exhorting them to this life in the present. Remember, what kind of ruler is he saying be submissive to? Who's ruling? And he writes this. <laughs> so Titus, this is this is probably Nero. Okay. Anybody remember anything about Nero? Great guy. He might win a presidential election. Okay. Not a great guy. Pretty much loses his mind, but yet because he's emperor, hey, we've got a crazy emperor. Okay? Uh, at first, Nero is kind to Christians. He kind of lets them be, but eventually something happens, and Nero's just like, I hate all Christians, I hate Christ, and I want to kill them all. He's the one who takes Christians, arrests them, binds them up around posts in his courtyards, lights them on fire after dusting them in oil so he can have torches for his parties. That's who Paul's writing about. So do we submit to that? Sure. Why? The hope of eternal life. My life here and now doesn't end here and now. 
If Caesar wants to come in and end my life here and now, I go there. Okay. I understand that part. Yeah. It's just that I don't know why you're that. Not a I didn't say that. You have redress. You have responsibilities and duties as a Christian and as a citizen. And you are to use your citizenship as a Christian. Okay, and we're going to get into that in, in weeks to come, right? That, that yeah, part of honoring and, and authorities is sometimes being that citizen that asks the pointed question or who files the appeal or who writes the legislator and says, hey, this isn't good for our community. Who, who calls up the city councilman. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is something that is good to do as a Christian, as a citizen. Because God made you a citizen. And so citizen is a certain job with certain duties attached to it, and you ought to do them. And it's far deeper than just casting a ballot. Right? So, yeah, submit to the authorities. Well, the authority is, you know, tells you you have these appeals, these ways of addressing, these ways of expressing your concern, this way of voting, this way of running for office. There's nothing in God's word that says a Christian can't run and, and rule. That doesn't get a child up to peace. Well, not in a specific case, usually. Although, you pressed until it happened. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There are great evils that go on. The devil is a, a is a roaring lion looking around for someone to devour, and he has servants who are his slaves who do his bidding, and that often involves horrible, heinous things to other humans. But as Christians, we can use our Christianity to help them as they have need, but we can also, as Christian citizens of this country, use that citizenship to address the issue. Okay? We use everything we've been given as Christians to, to be godly. Okay? Um, so, 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 yeah, there, there is things we can do. You know? Paul is the example of this, right? Uh, he, he uses his citizenship for godliness. But he also uses it greatly for spreading the gospel. He literally has the Roman government pretty much pay his way to do his mission trip to, to Rome. Although he has to pay for a good portion of it himself. That's the, that's the cause of him going to Rome. This is a, his right to appeal to Caesar. He goes there. You have every expectation of, of these rights and privileges that have been given to you as citizens of this country that you may exercise them as a Christian and use that for goodness for your neighbor's sake. Because that's the other part of this, right? We can be Christians in all these situations in life. Why? For the good of others. That everything we're given is for others. That includes your citizenship. So a Christian can go to the voting booth and vote for the sake of others. Whereas the pagan goes to the voting booth and goes, oh, what's the best for me? Okay, That's not how Christians go to the voting booth. Nor is that how we address our councilmen, commissioners, government, and so forth. We address them for the sake of the others. Always. Okay. Um, the saying is trust here much and insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Okay. So you believed in God that you would be careful to devote yourself to good works. Okay. We are given the Holy Spirit who keeps us, and that our spiritual life found in our font, in our pulpit, and our altar uh, results in an earthly life that is in light of it. So in the end, everything becomes spiritual. Your whole life. Romans 12, uh, 1 through 21 um, is just a great example of this. <coughs> I'll only cover portions of it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, 
by the mercies of God. So this is, again, Paul writing to Rome. He's going to give a comprehensive list of what he believes and teaches because he's never met these people before. This is one of the rare epistles where Paul hasn't met them. And so he's having to introduce himself and his theology to them because he's hoping to get to them and launch westward to Spain to preach to Spain. But he knows there's Christians in Rome, and so he's writing to them. And he's appealed to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So he's going to go back to the mercies of God to present to our bodies as a living sacrifice. Again, here is, is this living sacrifice idea, and this is meaning it's for someone else. Um, a living sacrifice, I've said this before many times, would be utterly foreign to a pagan or formerly pagan ear. Because sacrifice implies something shed its blood and something died. So a living sacrifice is a, is a, is a paradox. And yet that's what Paul writes. That's what the Holy Spirit tells us our lives ought to be. A living sacrifice. So giving of ourselves for others. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And uh, which is your betray on your service, liturgy. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, and then apply there, and then doing that. Okay. And then he gets into how this works out. You don't think too highly of yourself more than you others. To think with sober judgment. And then he talks about how all of us might have different roles. Guess what? You may go golfing with the city councilman. Boy, there's a gift. Okay. You may be more quiet. Maybe you don't have the gift to go speak publicly. Okay. You've been given some gifts. Okay. You run into this a lot of times when you visit shut-ins. Because of their situation in life, they can't do anything. Right? But yet I can tell you that, that you know, as far as prayers go, our shut-ins are prayerful people. May not be able to go do anything, but they do plenty. Because they pray. But then notice how it just all works together. Individually members, one of another. The body of Christ, interconnected. Right? Different gifts. Different use. Okay. And then, of course, let love be genuine and for what is evil. Here's what you're talking about, abhorring what is evil. Yeah, that's good. People sinning horribly against children, that's horrible and that's evil, and we should abhor it. Yeah, and we should use what we have to help with it, to help curb it. Okay. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. So, how does the world do on that? In the last five years of pastoral ministry, we hear the charge of narcissism more and more and more. It's become like the buzzword of our day, right? Narcissism, narcissism. Uh, okay, that's now got a name, but just selfishness. Okay, the world is selfish. The single nature is selfish. And so to, to show outdo one another in showing honor is about the most contrary to selfish thing we can do. That's what we're called to do. So behind all this is, yes, showing you what it is to be a Christian and to manage your life and situations in life as a Christian, but then also to maybe point out to you that when you're doing that, you're going to be veered to the world. You're going to be very notable to the world because they're going to be like, what on earth? Why does he always speak so nice about other people? Why doesn't he just enjoy it with the gossip and the so forth? Let's run people down. Come on, that's more fun. Huh? We're supposed to be different than the world. Okay? Honor one another. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Okay? This is the kind of thing. This defeatism is, is commonplace. Oh, we're just losing our country. We're losing... Hey, you know what? That's not... be, be... Don't be slothful in zeal. Look at the opportunity of it. 
we have a real opportunity to, to be Christians in a world, and it's going to be a stark contrast from the way the world is. And people are going to be like, what on earth are they doing? <clears throat> kind of neat, because that's, that's the way the early church worked. And, and when you read about the early church, the pagans kept scratching their heads. Yeah, they'd get mad as heck at times. They'd hate Christians. But then there's so many times where they'd be like, what are you doing? Why are you acting this way? And the church was stumbling over itself as people were joining it. Because it was so different. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. We're going to get to that. I'm going to do a whole week on hospitality, I think. Um, because I think that's one area that we really need to correct. Because again, that would be very different than the world around us. The world around us is I don't do anything in my front yard because people might see me. I'm going to have everything in my backyard. And I'm going to have a big fence. No one can look in. And it'll be just my little place, and that's it. And I don't know my neighbors, and I won't know anything like that. No. Don't do that. You need to be hospitable. And that's a notable difference from the world. Okay? Then he gets into it really bad. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Yeah. How different than the world is that? The world is what? You curse me? I got better curse words than that. Right? That's the world. We're not called to that. Live in harmony with one another. Not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Okay, you just have to think about Jesus. Would Jesus hang out with whoever? Sometimes it was rich men like Zacchaeus. A lot of times it's poor, sick, outcast. Yeah, associate with anybody. Okay? Repay no one evil for evil and so forth. And then, of course, Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, much like what we hear third from Titus. Again, he's writing that about Nero. <laughs> All right. So that is our spiritual life as it affects the earthly life with it. Um, I don't know if I have time for this one. Yeah, I can get into it just a little bit. I've got a couple of minutes. So what stands in the way of your godliness? Right? Because it, it, it's hard to be godly. It's really hard. It's almost like our chief enemy is within us. Right? So here's what stands in the way. Sin. Original sin. Genesis 3 for that, right? That we lose the image of God in Adam. Because he took the fruit. He's selfish. If you read Eve's inner thoughts, uh, she's utterly selfish as you consider the word of the serpent about the fruit. She shifted to that self-concern rather than concern for others. Even for God. And, but that has lost us that image of God. So the original godliness we had is gone. Now it's being restored to us by Christ and through the Holy Spirit's word. But it was originally was gone. Okay, so that means we have a corrupted, sinful nature. This is the part of you that naturally knows how to sin. This is the part of you that's naturally rebellious, that is is naturally uh, twisted, uh, which naturally thinks of the self first. Okay, um, this is what it is to be in the image and likeness of Adam, which happens in Genesis 5, and it's reiterated again in Romans 5, that in Adam all die. So your chief enemy here, it's going to be, yes, the devil and the world, but first and foremost is your sinful nature. It does not want you to be godly. It wants you to come up with all sorts of reasons to keep your Sunday morning life here, and then a whole different life Everywhere else. Okay? Because it's fine with that. Okay, you can put on some religious show. Fine. But the rest of your life, I get you. Okay? That's what it wants. The world, with all of its pressures, cares, and concerns, I, I meant what I said in the sermon today, that this world is run by anxiety. It's not just that people are anxious and worried about things. It's that the whole world, 
all of the uh, governments, all of the businesses, all of the things are all operating on anxiety. They're all operating because they think they can control tomorrow, which creates this inner anxiety. And so the world just operates by it. But Jesus says, we don't have to. Okay? We're called to faith, not worry. Okay? So that means that we're going to be confronted with the world's pressures, cares, and concerns all around us, pressing in on us. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't want to go to First John 2. If you are familiar with the story of Eve and how she considers this, you will find a uh, very similar thing here. This verse, because this is this is the path that Eve takes when she considers the fruit. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Why do we be? Why are we called to be the way we are as Christians? That's why. The world is passing away. All you're hearing is death screams. It's like a, a wounded animal who will fight hardest right before they die. So you have the world. Okay. It causes you to do the will of God. That means you would abide forever. Okay, so that's the world. You also have the devil. Um, so here you have the parable of the sower, by the way, Mark, Ford, and that's I referenced that in the sermon today as well. You have the devil who tempts, perverts, twists, and tricks. And there you have the temptation of Jesus as a good example. How he tries to twist things around on Jesus, both his bodily need for food, but also he tries to twist God's word. Okay. Uh, idolatry, mammon, anti-repentance or defensiveness or self-justifications, all of these things stand in the way of our godliness. So when you see your sinful nature and selfishness pop mm -hmm. up, you have to start realizing and taking an effect in your mind, listen, that doesn't want me to be godly. That wants me to be tore away from God. When the world puts its pressures and cares and concerns on you, you should have a right mindset to realize Oh, that's what's happening. The world is just trying to distract me and, and tear me away from God again. Oh, the devil is throwing some kind of temptation before me. Oh, he just wants me to not be my Jesus. Okay? But coming to that realization as you interact with the world, coming to that realization as you see things happen in your day-to-day -day life, realizing this is not for my godliness. This is actually for me to be ungodly. I don't want to be around this. Okay. Um, and that sometimes is in the world, but also obviously here when you get to idols, that's immensely inside of us. Okay. Idol creating is the job of the human heart, so to speak. It's a perfect factory of idols. Always coming up with false things to trust. Okay. All right. Any quick, quick, quick questions? Because that one way too long. So. All right, uh, next week we will continue with uh, some side trips. Uh, what I'm calling, but I just want to go talk about something else for a second. Um, so we'll talk about being of the world, or what it is to be of the world versus just in the world. Um, we'll talk about that next week and we'll get into the topic of good works. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have created us. You have sent and given your Son that we have been redeemed. You've given us your Holy Spirit that you would be sanctified. Help us in our day-to-day -day lives to reflect this fact as Christians. Give us your Holy Spirit. Allow us to think of things happening inside of us, around us, and so forth in terms of godliness and ungodliness. Help us to remain faithful through it all. And when we err, draw us to repentance that we would come to you and to your Son, Jesus, for our forgiveness. Through his name we pray. Amen. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the kingdom of the Holy Spirit, we give you all. Amen.